Ayo Sri Vrindavan, Sri Vrindavan, Sri Vrindavan, Jai Sri Vrindavan. मुखम करोति बाचलम भंगुम मंगयते गिरिं यत कृपातम हम बंदे श्री गुरु दीनदारनो by the mercy of the spiritual master even a blind man can see the stars in the sky even a lame man can cross mountains and even a dumb man can speak eloquently since I have lost my voice I pray for the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and all the assembled Vaishnavas that I'll be given some ability to serve you by speaking Hare Krishna it is a miracle in this material world samashita ye pada palava plavam mahat padam punya yasho murari bhavam budirvatsa padam 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 yadvi padam nadesham this is a place where there is danger at every step it's a miracle that anybody survives moment after moment in this world. There's millions of ways in which we can be lamed, tortured, or killed at any second. Is there not? Knowing that there's danger at every step in this world, a devotee takes shelter of Krishna. Because in the mercy of the Lord, the vast ocean of material existence is reduced to the quantity of water contained in it hoofprint of a small cat. Even great scholars, ascetics, they cannot under they cannot overcome the three modes of material nature. But Krishna tells Daivi He Shuguna Mayi Mama Maya Duratriya, Mami Vamya Prabhupada Maya Meta Tirandi. that the three modes of material nature which is being <clears throat> orchestrated by Maya impossible to overcome but one who surrenders to me can easily cross beyond it how to surrender to Krishna <clears throat> There are nine processes of devotional service in which 
we can express our earnest desire to surrender to Krishna, beginning with hearing and chanting. Hearing Krishna's Leela creates a taste for loving devotional service to the Lord. Hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord cleanses the heart or the mind of all the accumulated selfish egoistic attachments that are the root cause of all suffering. Hearing about Krishna kills the apathy to hear about Krishna. Just like rock candy. Rock candy or sugar candy is very bitter to one who has jaundice. Although actually it is very sweet. But if we just continue to taste it and tolerate the apparent bitterness, gradually we become purified of the disease and then we can taste the nectar. So at the beginning, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord may be an austerity. Why? Because since time immemorial we have cultivated and conditioned the taste for hearing the topics of this mundane world. Prajalpa is such a powerful force. <clears throat> the whole world is speaking Prajalpas. Except for in Vrindavan where all the birds and animals are singing about Krishna. Even the insects are speaking Prajalpa. The birds are singing Prajalpa. The dogs are barking Prajalpa. The television stations, the radio stations, the internet, it's all Prajalpa. In the 1970s, an achievement of technology was, what was it called? Telex? What, what is that? Telex. Huh? Before even fax. Telex. 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 Uh, te whatever it was. It was a way where you could somehow or other, in a very, very crude way, all the temples could communicate with one another. And they asked Srila Prabhupada, can we set this system up in our temples? And Prabhupada said, if you do, you will simply speak Prajalpa. <laughs> so I wonder what Prabhupada would think about the internet. <laughs> it's a fact. The internet is nothing but Prajalpa. <clears throat> On September... 11th, yes, September 11th of 2001, when the World Trade Center was destroyed by terrorists. Very, very sad, unfortunate situation. So many lives were lost. But something very revealing took place also. I read that <clears throat> From the time the internet was first inaugurated, the number one keyword search, that means the one, number one word that everyone was searching information about, was sex. And in all the years of internet's history, sex has always been number one. It never, ever, ever came below number five. Prajalpa. But after 9-11, the, the next day, sex was like number 150. <laughs> because when people take life a little bit seriously, they understand what Prajalpa is about. <clears throat> There's a beautiful lecture where Srila Prabhupada is explaining how when you speak Prajalpa, all your spiritual energy 
and your very spiritual life force is just draining out of your life. Just draining out of your heart. That is the effect of gossip. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada, he performed so many austerities to write his books so that we have something to talk about. <clears throat> so that we share this information, this knowledge with us. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, Mach chita madgata prana bodhiyanta parasparam khatiyan pashtamam nityam thushyanti charamanti cha this is the quality of my sincere and genuine devotees. When they gather together, they take great satisfaction and bliss discussing amongst one another topics about Krishna. Rupa Goswami explains, one of the principles for a sincere devotee is not to waste a moment. Krishna has given us this power of speech and as I'm experiencing and Kostuba Prabhu has experienced, he could take it away in a second. This power of speech is not ours, it is God's. It is his property and therefore it is sinful to use it for any other purpose than his will. Yes. If it is your power of speech, then you have any right to use it any way you want. But it's been given to you by the grace of God and it can be taken away at any moment by the grace of God. Everything is Krishna's property. He is the ability of man. So to reciprocate with Krishna, we want to always speak about Krishna. We want to always hear about Krishna. And this eagerness to hear <clears throat> and chant the glories of the Lord is very pleasing to the Lord. Srila Prabhupada often emphasized the importance of enthusiasm, eagerness in everything we do in Krishna consciousness because that gives our devotional service life. Without an eagerness and enthusiasm, then whatever we do, whether it's hearing or chanting, it's more or less mechanical and ritualistic. What gives substance to our hearing, our chanting, and our service is our enthusiasm to please Guru, Vaishnavas, and Krishna in what we're doing. Maharaj Pariksha was sitting at Shukadeva Goswami's lotus feet. He only had seven days to live. And by the time the tenth canto was being spoken, he only had a couple more days to go. Till inevitable death would come upon him. But he was so enthusiastic to hear. He told Sukadeva Goswami that <clears throat> the Harikatamrita the nectar of the pastimes of Lord Hari that is flowing from your mouth is completely satisfying my heart. Although so many days has gone by and have not taken a drop of water or a morsel of food, I'm feeling no hunger or thirst. I'm fully satisfied just hearing this nectar from you. Previously, Maharaj Parikshit was in a forest and he was thirsty. And you know what happened when he was thirsty? He lost his intelligence. By the arrangement of the Lord. And he went to uh, Sami Krishi Prabhu's ashram. And, and, he, and he asked the sage for a little water. But Sami Krishi Prabhu was in Samadhi meditating on Krishna. So he didn't hear him. So Maharaj Parikshit, whose life and soul was to honor, respect, and serve the great souls, how did he do such a crazy thing? With his 
tip of his bow he put a dead snake like a garland around Samigrishi Puru's shoulder. And for that he was cursed to die in seven days by Shringi, the son of the Brahman. So Maharaj Parikshit is marveling over this phenomena. A little bit of thirst, where he hadn't drunk water in just a few hours, and he was so much in distress. But here, it's been days and days and days with no food and no water, and he was completely fresh, completely enlivened and satisfied just hearing the glories of Krishna and Krishna's holy name. Hearing the glories of Krishna produces attachment to Krishna, ashakti. And if we carry on hearing the glories of Krishna, our heart becomes further purified and it awakens rati or bhava. And by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord further into more purified states, it awakens praying or pure love. Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur explains, and listen carefully, at the beginning, when we actually begin to develop a taste for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, we develop very intimate friendships with the devotees. That is a sign of the person who's actually making spiritual progress that deep heartfelt friendships are made amongst the devotees. And when we attain the state of Prem, our beloved Acharya explains, at that time, from our heart awakens unconditional love for all living beings. Thakur Bhakti Vinod explains that love of God, real affection in the heart toward Krishna, when it is directed toward the living beings of this world, it manifests as compassion. Compassion is an attribute of love. We may not have compassion, we may not have love, but the process of gaining this is described in the Bhagavatam. Srinvatam sukata krishna punya sravana kirtana hridyanta asto yabadani vidunoti surit sitam When we develop a real taste for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, the Lord is so pleased that within the heart he eradicates all misconceptions, he annihilates all anartas and reveals himself. But how to develop that taste? By serving great souls the affinity to hear about Krishna awakens within our heart. When Srila Prabhupada asked us to be instruments of his compassion by serving his will, by serving his devotees, that was the mercy that he gave us in which we can attain the highest ultimate perfection of life. Maharaj Parikshit was very, very eager to hear about how Krishna appeared within this world. Shukadeva Goswami explains, and also Padma Purana and Aracharyas explain from other points of view. To create 
a fuller and fuller picture. I'd like to speak briefly on this subject and this some little particle from the ocean of subjects of the place we are in today. We have come to Mahavan or Goku, the eternal abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Whenever Krishna appears within this world, he appears in Mathura and Goku. Actually, Krishna is eternally existing within Goku. He doesn't, in one sense, he descends. Yes? When Lord Brahma was with the demigods on the shore of the ocean of milk, Chira Sagar, he heard a voice. It was the voice of Lord Narayan that I am soon coming to incarnate within this world and tell the devatas that they should incarnate as their planar expansions within the Yadu dynasty. It was a desperate condition that brought the demigods to the shore of the ocean of milk. Kamsa and other asuras, Jarasandha, were just plundering the earth. And the earth was so much in distress that she appeared in the form of a cow, weeping tears, and cried for Brahma for help. So Lord Brahma proclaimed to the demigods the Lord's will. So Chirodakshai Vishnu descends, but actually Krishna is always living in Vrindavan, in his Aprakata, in his un. In, in his eternal lila, that it cannot be experienced through mundane senses. Only when our eyes are ornamented with the decoration of love can we see Krishna as he is. The scriptures and the acharyas explain that Krishna's astakaliya lila. His, his pastimes are always taking place in Vrindavan. But when Krishna performs his Prakata Leela, his manifested pastimes, people could see. And what he performed in his Leela is written so we could hear about it. And thus he establishes his presence for the conditioned souls to remember him and become purified. So actually, when Krishna descends, he merges into his original form that's already here in Vrindavan. Sri Krishna Bhagavan Ki Jai! In the Yadu dynasty, there was a great king named Devamidha. He had two sons, one from a Vaishya wife and one from a Chachir wife. From Chachir wife, his son was Surasena. And he gave birth to Vasudev. From the Vaishya wife, he gave birth to Parajanya. Arjanya was given the area of Mahaban to be the ruling king of the cowherd men and cowherd ladies. This was the abode of Arjanya, Mahavan and Vrindavan. He had five sons, Upananda, Abhinanda, Nanda, Sunanda and Nandan. When Vasudev was married to Devaki, on that very night, Kamsa, who was his 
loving brother-in-law who has wanted to please his sister by taking her to her husband's home by driving chariot, taking a menial position of her servant just to satisfy his loving sister. But then the demigod spoke from the sky. Come, so you are a fool. The eighth child of your sister will be the cause of your death. So much for his loving sentiments. <laughs> with his left hand he grabbed her hair, with his right hand he drew his sword, and he was about to sever her head. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vasudev was pleading, Oh, Kamsa, you're the pride of your entire dynasty. You have such a great reputation, everyone reveres you. You will totally lose your reputation. How can you act in such a way to kill your own sister? He spoke nice philosophy. Because the Bhagavatam says that it is the duty of every human being to try to protect his life or her life as far as possible. Within proper principles of morality and integrity. that death is certain for everyone. The real thing is how we live. If you, cre if you cause this, this, this cruel deed to your sister, you're going to have to suffer hellish consequences. Don't you know you're not this body, you're the eternal soul? Why do you want to subject your soul to such condemnation? But Kamsa could not hear philosophy because he was envious. So Dasudev pleaded, I'll give you every one of my sons and you can deal with them. There is no danger from Devaki. So Kamsa agreed. And he killed one after another six children. Hare Krishna. Meanwhile, one of Vasudev's wives, Rohini, was sent to Mahaban to be under the care of Nanda Maharaj. Because Vasudev and Nanda Maharaj were the best of friends. And she lived very happily, like in intimacy, like a sister of Yashodavai, the queen of Braj. Balaramji is eternally the son of Rohini. But by Krishna's will, he entered into the womb of Devaki in the mood of Shesha. To, because already the six Garba Suras, six demons were already killed from the womb of Devaki. And it is described that these six asuras represent lust, envy, anger, pride, greed, and illusion. Before Krishna manifests in our heart, first we have to kill these demons within us. Krishna is in our heart, but he will not manifest till all these demons are slain. And how are they slain? Prabhupada explains that Kamsa represents fear of material existence and Devaki represents devotion and a sincere devotee. When a devotee is very serious and takes shelter of Krishna knowing the dangers of material existence, then the anartas of the heart are destroyed. In other words, we can't take devotional service as something very light or something very mild. We must be very serious about it. There's danger at every step. When a devotee is fearless, they may be fearless because they, to serve the Lord, they're willing to give up their body, they're willing to give up their possessions, they're willing to give up their prestige. 
devotees fear forgetting Krishna. They have a healthy fear of Maya because they know she's all powerful. If you don't fear Maya, unless you're a Paramhamsa, you will not attentively and strictly chant at least 60 rounds every day. Yes? Srila Prabhupada said that if you're not chanting at least 16 rounds attentively every day, at any moment you will become victim to Maya. <clears throat> and even Krishna arranged for Lord Brahma to appear to be a victim of Maya. It is our position. So we should fear Maya. But that fear of Maya shouldn't bring us distress. Like a little baby, when a baby is in a fearful situation, what does the baby do? Immediately takes shelter and loudly cries out for its mother. So in this way, by taking shelter of Krishna in the spirit of devotion, having fear of the power of Maya, to never let go of Krishna's mercy, to never let go of the association of devotees who are saving us at every moment, we become purified. And Balaram entered to be to prepare the heart of Devaki perfectly. He is the original guru. That is the guru's position. To arrange the heart of a disciple for the appearance of God. And he also, like Shesha, he, he created a sitting place and a nice bed and everything within the womb of Devaki for Krishna to reside. But one night at midnight, Rohini, who was in Mahaban, she was also pregnant with a child. She had a dream that she had a miscarriage. And then she woke up and she saw that she actually did. Then Yoga Maya spoke to her and said, the child that was in your womb has been Transfer and Balara and then Balaram entered into her womb. Actually the original Balaram. So it was here in Gokul Mahaban where we're sitting that Sri Balaramji was born to Rohini within this material world. Balaramji ki. Yeah! On Krishna's order, Yoga Maya transferred Balaram from Devaki's womb to Rohini's. Then Krishna entered into the mind of Vasudeva and was transferred to the heart of Devaki. And she became effulgent. And even the demigods were offering her prayer. Meanwhile, in Vrindavan, Nanda Maharaj had such good qualities. Everyone loved him so much that although Upananda was the eldest son, he was meant to be the next king. And Parjanya wanted to renounce all of his responsibilities and just completely immerse himself in bhakti. So he offered the kingship of Mahavan to Upananda. But Upananda felt in his heart that Nanda Maharaj, he has such glorious qualities. Everyone loves him so much. I want him to be king. We see in this world, 
elections, how people are fighting for Keshe, and blaspheming each other like anything, trying to get that position. People are willing to hold on to their position to the fag end of their life. Yes? But in Vrindavan, nobody's concerned with position. Uddhava, greatest of the devotees of Dwarka, he wanted to be a lump of grass, a little creeper on the ground where everyone would step on his head and give dust. That is Uddhava. Brahma and Shiva, they are praying to become mountains so everyone will step on their heads and they'll get dust. So Vrindavan is not a place where people want position or power. Vrindavan is a place where people simply want to serve. So Upananda and Nanda Maharaj was embarrassed, but everyone said, no, no, you be our king, you be our king. And his older brother was saying, please, you be our king. So Nanda Maharaj surrendered to the will of the Brijabhasis and became Brajendra. But he had no child. Although he, there was another Gopa named Samuka, and he married his daughter, Yashoda, to Nanda Maharaj. Yashoda means one who gives fame and glory. It was the only sorrow of all the Brijabhasis that Nanda and Yashoda had no child. But here in Mahavan, both Nanda and Yashoda would regularly have simultaneously a dream where this beautiful child that absolutely enchanted their hearts would appear and they fell in love with this child with such motherly and fatherly devotion. They just wanted to be the mother and father of this child, but the child was only in a dream. And, and they could never be satisfied with any other child once seeing this child. So the Brijabhasis were performing all yajyas and everything to try to get the demigods and the Supreme Lord Narayan to give them child. But Nanda and Yashoda, they weren't cons they wanted that child. So they did a Dwadasi fast together. And Lord Narayan appeared to them simultaneously in their hearts and revealed that that child that has stolen your heart will soon become your own son. So they were very happy. And just after that, Yashodamai became pregnant. What happened is this, Krishna entered into her heart and his younger sister, Yogamaya, entered into her womb. And at midnight, on the at the time that we celebrate Janamastami, Krishna appeared from the womb of Devaki in the prison cell of Kamsa in Mathura in a majestic form with a crown and kostubamani and holding a kanksha in the lotus flower and the sudarshan chakra and uh, kanksha. And Vasudeva and Dev Devaki were understanding that God Almighty has become our son and they offered very nice prayers. But Yashoda Mai still had, they still had parental affection for God Almighty, Narayan. So Yashoda asked in her motherly concern, if Kamsa sees you like this, he'll know you are the enemy that has been prophesied and he might hurt you. So please disguise yourself as the ordinary baby. That was her love. Meanwhile, right here in Mahaban. Yashodamai gave birth to a son and a daughter. 
Krishna and Yoga Maya. But by Yoga Maya's potency, she was so tired that she fell asleep and forgot everything. So Nanda Maharaj, he was told by Lord Krishna to take him across Yamuna and exchange him with the daughter of Yashoda. So as he was crossing Yamuna, after all the guards fell asleep and the chains on their legs just immediately opened up and all the doors opened up, he left. As he was passing through Yamuna, Prabhupada explains that Krishna slipped from his hands and fell in Yamuna because Yamuna was Yamuna Mai was longing and longing to do some seva for Krishna. And then he brought her up, brought Krishna up. And it is explained, different commentators have different explanations in detail of exactly. Some say that actually this Krishna that was brought merged into Krishna in Mahaban, some say merged in, the two merged into one in Mathura. But when that little innocent childish baby, Krishna, the Vasudev Krishna that was born of Vasudev merged into the original form of Gopal, the son of Nanda and Yashoda. So thus, according to Srila Prabhupada and all of our Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas, Krishna was born here in Gokul Mahavan. Vasudev brought Yogamaya back to Mathura. And she cried. And as soon as she cried, everybody woke up. And then Kamsa came running down and Yishma, Devaki was saying, No, 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 please don't. This is my only child. She's a daughter. She won't hurt you. Please let me have, let me have one child. Just one child, please. <clears throat> Kamsa was so cruel. Although his sister was just helplessly crying piteously. He just pulled the little helpless infant baby out of her hands and went to dash her against a stone to crush her head. But she slipped out of his hands and went into the sky and manifested her form of Durga with many weapons and told Kamsa that you are a great fool. <laughs> the child you are fearing has already been born somewhere else. And then she disappeared. But it is explained, Yoga Maya was born to Yashoda. But when she came to Mathura, when she crossed the Yamuna and came into Mathura, the original Yoga Maya expanded herself as Mahamaya. Because Kamsa cannot touch Yoga Maya. Yoga Maya is the personification of, pure, of praying. It is the energy that facilitates all intimate, ecstatic, loving relationships in the spiritual world. How could Kamsa possibly have any contact with Yoga Maya? Yoga Maya in bewilders a devotee to increase their love and the intimacy of their affection for Krishna. Mahamaya bewilders the soul to forget Krishna and be completely immersed in the concept that I am this body and I am this mind. So Mahamaya told Kamsa his destiny that the child that is to kill you has already been born. Kamsa became very sobered by this incident and he fell at the feet of Devaki and Vasudev and begged forgiveness. Can you imagine? What a nonsense rascal. <laughs> His own sister and brother-in-law 
He's kept him in prison for years. He's murdered right in front of their eyes six of their infant children. One escaped in the form of a miscarriage, Balaram. At least it appeared that way. And he was about to kill this little girl, even though David, he was pleading. And now he's begging forgiveness. And he's saying, actually, everything happens by one's karma, so please. <laughs> please forgive me. And Vasudev and Devaki were such saints that they forgave him. He said, oh, actually, what you're saying is correct. It was all meant to be. You are forgiven. And they very affectionately and graciously were kind to him. And even gave him solace and spoke very kind words to, to pacify his heart. That is Vaishnav. But Khan, meanwhile, here in Mahaban, where we sit today, when Yashoda Mai woke up, the first thing she saw was the beautiful moonlike face of Gopal. His loving lotus eyes, his complexion like a blue lotus, his every limb which more enchanting than anything in all of existence. So soft, so delicate. The reservoir of sweet beauty. Yashoda Mai just looked at his face and wept incessant tears of love. The other ladies, gopis, they all gathered around and practically speechlessly immersed in such enchantment they could not stop gazing upon Yashoda Nanda. And they sent a Brahmin's wife, Brahmani, to give the news to Nanda Maharaj. By this time it was early morning. And what do the Gopas do in the early morning? They have no need for sadhana. They're beyond that. 24 hours a day, their pure loving devotional service is beyond all sadhana. You cannot imitate that. We rise early in the morning and we offer obeisances and chant our rounds and go to Mangalarti and so many study the scriptures. But they rise and milk the cows. <laughs> and it's so nice today that we're having this kata in this goshala. Where you're all sitting is 24 hours a day the place where cows are eating and resting and giving milk. Gokul, the land of cows. And we are sitting in the very place where the cows are kept. In fact, the cows are so merciful. When we came, they all moved aside. But they left behind the dust. When Krishna was a cowherd boy, this was one of his most beautiful ornaments. Is his beautiful body would be covered by the dust that was raised from the hooves of the cows and the calves. So they were milking cows. And the Brahmani came. And when Nanda and Yash Upananda and the other cowherd men saw her, she was trying to tell them something. But she was in so much ecstasy, she could not speak. She was just trembling. And she was just so happy. She was the personification of joy. She didn't have to say anything. They understood. The only thing that could bring a Brijabasi this kind of joy is Yashoda has given birth. And then finally she came, she had the ability to give the news. And Nanda Maharaj was so happy with this news, he gave her 
thousands and thousands of cows and silks and gold and everything just because she gave him that news that his son was born and he was in so much ecstasy. He was weeping, he was crying, he was trembling, he was trying to get to the place where Krishna was, but he kept falling down and getting up and falling down and getting up and falling down and getting up and falling down and getting up. <laughs> And he went home and he took his bath and he put on nice clothes and he came. And there he had the first sight of Krishna, Gopal in the arms of Yashoda Maya. And Rohini and the other gopis who were singing beautiful songs in love gave the child to Nanda Maharaj to embrace. Nanda Maharaj was so happy, he declared, there will be a festival, Nandotsava. And here, this particular temple that we are at, is the place of the house of Nanda Maharaj. There are 84 pillars, and some of the original pillars, it is said, are still in this temple. And it is in this house Krishna performed unlimited childhood pastimes. Krishna lived here in Gokul Mahaban for three years and four months before going to Vrindavan Forest. The whole of Mahaban, the whole of Braj was in such exuberant happiness that they all wore the best clothes that they have. Ladies were wearing their nicest saris and putting on beautiful ornaments and the men were putting on their nice colored turbans. Even Rohini. It is explained that according to tradition when a woman's husband is not at home she dresses very simple. But on this day to rejoice the birth of Krishna the son of Nanda and Yashoda, she dressed elegantly. And they all came running from all directions, just like rivers coming in all directions to the house of Nanda Maharaj, all to gaze upon the beauty of Gopal. There were Brahmins performing yagyas to invoke auspiciousness. There was other Brahmins who were chanting Vedic mantras. Brijabhasi Gopal Gopas and gopis were composing songs about the beauty of Gopal and about the, the wonderful qualities of Nanda and Yashoda. And they were singing these wonderful songs and everyone was singing and dancing and they brought Krishna and put him on a beautiful altar and performed Abhishekam with Panchagavya and Panchamrita and all auspicious articles as conch shells were being blown and wonderful Vedic instruments were being played. Everyone was dancing and singing, rejoicing, seeing the beauty, the sweetness of Gopal. They were so happy and celebrating. Nanda Maharaj, his wealth was in his yogurt and ghee and butter and milk products. So he gave so much that all the thousands and thousands and thousands of Brijabhasis were very lovingly throwing yogurt and butter upon each other. It's an exchange of love. In this way, Krishna, on the very day that he appeared to the eyes of the Brijabhasis, completely stole their hearts. From that day here in Gokul Mahaban, everyone lived exclusively for Krishna's pleasure. Their bodies, minds, words, and lives were 24 hours a day offerings for Krishna. That is the spontaneous nature of pure love. To the degree love 
awakens within our heart, there is a spirit of selfless servitude, being willing to sacrifice anything and everything for the happiness of the object of our love. That is love. And Krishna is the supreme object of everyone's love. But here in Gokul, Krishna manifests the highest, sweetest perfection of that love in the hearts of his devotees. Just a couple days after Krishna's appearance, Nanda Maharaj was given the news that he had to go to Mathura with the other senior gopas to pay his taxes to the king, Kamsa. So he left. Meanwhile, Kamsa, who was so evil, so demoniac, due to bad association, and also Narada Muni, <laughs> good association, he understood that actually any of these children could be Krishna. I mean, any of these, any child anywhere could be the person who is coming to kill me. So he was sending various demons to kill all children. And one of them, horrible, cruel-hearted witch named Putana. Prabhupada explained she is a particular type of witch called Kechari. Not Kichari, but Kechari. <laughs> And Prabhupada said, even in northern provinces of India, there are still Kachari witches, and you can see them flying on uprooted branches of trees in the sky. Hare Krishna. But she was so powerful, she could transform herself in any way she wanted. She was a gruesome Rakshashi. The Hari Bamsa explains that Putana took the form of a bird and flew into Vrindavan, Gokul, and then manifested the form of a most beautiful woman. This Putana had already slaughtered and drank the blood of thousands and thousands of helpless babies. And now she wanted to kill the son of Nanda. Yes, she came in a very... She came to Vrindavan in a way that nobody even noticed she arrived. And then she assumed this form, which was so beautiful that when the Brijabasi saw her, they were thinking, we have attained such good fortune. Is she a heavenly damsel? Or perhaps she's the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi Devi, who has appeared with her lotus flower in her hand just to bless the son of Nanda Maharaj. This was their thinking. She came right here and walked right into Nanda Maharaj's house. And Rohini and Devaki, I mean Rohini and Yashoda, were taking care of Krishna in their arms. They put him down to greet her. They had so much faith in her because she was glancing upon them so sweetly that they felt it was a great honor and blessing that she was picking up Gopal. She looked at Gopal and saw his beauty. And in her heart of hearts, she knew that for her, he was death personified. And Gopal looked at her and closed his eyes. Because the first demon he was to kill 
was a woman. And you're not supposed to kill women. But it's interesting because the first demon Ram killed was also a woman. <laughs> and he wasn't supposed to kill women either. But this shows how demonic these people are. That the Lord is willing to even cross over all conventions that he and all other living beings must, must observe to protect women. He closed his eyes. Also, he closed his eyes because he knew that she was the murderess of countless children. When she looked at Krishna, she didn't realize. She thought he was a rope, but actually she was picking up the snake of death. Rivo. And although her heart was fierce and cruel, she disguised herself in such a beautiful way that she was like a sharp, dangerous sword in a beautiful, ornamented sheath. She lifted Krishna, and everyone was so happy to see this. And in front of everybody's eyes, she placed her breast in baby Gopal's mouth. She had already smeared her breast with terrible, deadly poison, <laughs> enough to kill thousands of grown men. And she placed that breast in little baby Gopal's mouth. And the first thing Gopal did was with his little hands, they were only, his fingers were only like this. His fingers were like this. You've seen two, three-year-old baby's fingers. You mothers have seen brahmacharis. I don't know if you look at those things. <laughs> They're the most delicate things in the 14 worlds, a baby's fingers, yes. Gorangi Devi, you have seen? There's, there's nothing more delicate than an infant child's little fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Those little fingers of Gopal, just softer than, than, than the petals of a flower. They squeezed Putana. And oh, it caused her too much pain. He squeezed. And he was, she was and as he was squeezing, he started sucking. And he squeezed so hard and sucked so deep that Putana was in horrible, terrible pain. First Krishna sucked out all the poison, then he sucked some milk, then he was sucking out her very life force. And he was squeezing in such a way that it was unbearable for her. She couldn't tolerate it. She, she just started screaming. And she ran outside the house and ran into the pasture ground. And she was just crying out, Child, leave me, leave me, leave me. And with all of her force, she was trying to take Krishna off. But Krishna just kept squeezing and sucking. And she lost so much of her power. She couldn't any, way, all, any longer maintain her disguise. All of a sudden, <laughs> she just manifested her original form, which was 12 miles in size. Now a jet airplane only flies about 8 miles high. Hare Krishna. And Krishna did not expand himself. Can you imagine Putana in her enormous size and Krishna <laughs> squeezing? <laughs> he was still squeezing like a little insect on her. He was still squeezing. And she was trying with all of her force. She was trying to pull him off and he was just squeezing and squeezing and sucking and sucking. And she was pulling. She was, child, leave me. She was screaming. When she screamed, the whole 14 worlds were shaking. 
The bridge Abbasis were terrified hearing this scream, this roar. And ultimately, Gopal sucked out her very life, and Putana fell to the ground and destroyed trees up to 12 miles away. And ultimately, Gopal sucked out her very life, and Putana fell to the ground and destroyed trees up to 12 miles away. But by Krishna's arrangement, Krishna is so expert, he can fulfill so many of his purposes in any one act. Krishna caused Putana to fall in a direction that she totally destroyed Kamsa's favorite garden. <laughs> he spent so much time growing these big trees for so many years and it was his pleasure grove and Putana <laughs> And she was laying there and Krishna was crawling on her breast. It was like a mountain. He was just crawling. He was playing. He was very smiling and playing. And the gopis were running. They had to run to try to find Krishna. And Putana's body, it says her thighs were like riverbanks. Her fingers were like massive bridges. Her teeth were like gigantic plows. Her eyes were like sunken wells. Her belly was like a dried up lake. Horrible, beastly, massive creature was laying there. And Krishna was playing and smiling and laughing. So the gopis ran, ran, ran and they found, they brought Krishna down and put him in the arms of Yashoda Mai. And then the gopis began to perform Many different, the gopas and gopis perform many different rituals to protect Krishna from future danger. But they could not, they could not believe that it was Krishna that killed Putana. They were thinking because Lord Narayan always protects innocent, helpless children, it is the Lord that has caused her death because she is so cruel it was her own karma that caused her death but by Lord Narayan's mercy our Gopal has been protected when Nanda Maharaj returned home and saw Putana laying in the pastures <laughs> what is this <laughs> And then when he found out that she tried to kill Krishna, he was astonished. The gopas were afraid that Putana might come back to life. So they chopped her body up and started big fires and burnt her. Arivo. That's what sometimes Brijabhasis do with snakes. Yes, you have heard. Sometimes when you kill a snake, the snake can come back alive. So they burn. So in this way, this, they burnt her body, but because her body was touched by Krishna, the smoke that emanated from her body was so sweet, it was intoxicating like a guru. One of the worship, one of the scents that we worship the Lord with during puja. Putana represents the pseudo-guru, the false guru. When Srila Prabhupada came to the West, he identified so many false gurus. And actually nobody knew the difference between anything. Yes? When Prabhupada came to the West, anybody that came from India who had long hair was a guru. <laughs> Especially if he could say a couple words in Sanskrit or he can 
or he could close his eyes and look peaceful. Yes. So there were so many. And so many thousands and thousands of people were, were, were taking lessons and teachings and giving money and so many things. Because they didn't know. Prabhupada shocked people. When he would say, he is a cheater. He is a rascal. <laughs> what do you mean? He has long hair. He has a beard. How could he be a cheater and a rascal? <laughs> He's speaking nice things. He's talking about how I'm God and you're God and we're all God and Shanti, Shanti, we can be peaceful. Rascal. <laughs> cheater. Yes. Because when you put your faith in someone, if that person is not giving you the proper milk, he may be giving you poison. And yes, so many of these gurus. And when Prabhupada came to India, he was even stronger about this. So many are Mayavadis. So many are teaching that you will become God. That ultimately you are the supreme controller, you are the supreme enjoyer. That ultimately God is formless. And this knowledge poisons the propensity for devotional service. So we must be very careful. Evam parampara praptam. Therefore, real knowledge can be understood to be perfect when it is coming through parampara. Then we're getting the real nourishing milk of transcendental wisdom. Otherwise, people take knowledge from Vedas, which is like milk, but when they give their own interpretations, it's like putting poison in that milk. And it could cause a great disturbance to our inclination for devotional service. So Putana represents that. When we put faith in someone, they have the greatest capacity to cheat us and cause us pain. Srila Prabhupada said, my only qualification is I'm simply giving what my Guru Maharaj and the great Acharyas have given, as it is. Humble servant. Nanda Maharaj was so happy to see that Krishna was safe. He inspected all of his limbs to see if there was any injuries and then he embraced little Krishna and smelled his head and wept tears of love. When Krishna was three months old, There is a ceremony that was performed here in Goku Mahaban called Utana. Utana is the time when the Lord first begins to slant himself from his bed. It's actually the beginning stages of a child's crawling. Yes. Well, Srila Prabhupada explains that in Vedic culture the raising of a child was such a beautiful thing that there were ceremonies for every stage of a child's development. Not only ceremonies, but festivals. <laughs> Nanda and Yashoda had a festival because Krishna just started to slant and he was about to start crawling. So they had Brahmins chanting mantras and people were doing yajyas and the Vrijabhasis were singing and chanting and they did Abhishekam for Krishna and there were so many guests and so many Brahmins coming to Nanda and Yashoda's house to celebrate Uttana that Krishna is going to soon crawl. So Yashoda Mai, she wanted to receive all the guests that were coming to her house. So she entered into a courtyard and there was a hand-driven cart and Yashodamai laid down with Krishna under the cart. Prabhupada said, this is the motherly love of Yashodamai. 
she knew that Krishna would sleep nicely if he felt protected by his mother. So whenever Yashoda Mai would put Krishna to sleep, she would lay down with him in, his, in her embrace until he fell asleep. Then she would leave him there and go to her duties. That was her love. So she was receiving Brahmins and Krishna was under this big cart. On top of the cart were so many heavy materials of, of wares, pots and so many other things. Little Gopal woke up. When he opened his eyes, he felt thirsty for the love of his mother in the form of her milk. So he cried. But you showed him I was taking care of the Brahmins and there was instruments being played and everyone was singing, so she did not hear Krishna's cry. So Krishna wanted to get you showed him I's attention. Do you remember what he did? with his little tiny foot, three-month foot. <laughs> that little foot, he just he kicked the wheel of the cart. <laughs> Krishna Bhagavan Ki! Tumultuous sound, not like mine. All the... the, the, the the wheel of the cart separated from the axle of the cart and all the spokes broke and the wheel went flying and the whole cart fell to the ground and all the wares <laughs> fell. Very loud sound. And the bridge did when the bridge of Asis heard this, Nanda Yashoda, they all came running to the scene. What happened? What happened? And right amidst this big mess was little Gopal. Not even able to crawl yet. How Krishna did this is incredible. Krishna's lotus foot was softer and more tender than a new grown leaf of a tamal tree. And the cart was very hard wooden steel. Krishna just touched it. The cart was actually a demon of the name Sakatasura, who was a demon who, due to his sins, was in the body of a ghost. And he entered into that cart to kill Krishna. Krishna didn't show any extraordinary opulence. You know, Vamanadev, when he wanted to, sh when he wanted to cover the planetary systems, he expanded himself as Trivikram, so that his one step could be so gigantic to fulfill his purpose. And Narasimhadev also, when Vishnu wanted to kill. Hiranyakashipu, to fulfill the purpose of killing this Hiranyakashipu, he became Sri Naras Narasimha Bhagavan with razor sharp hard nails to tear him apart. But Krishna didn't exhibit any opulences. He just remained the same little baby Gopal. He, did, he didn't need to change because Gopal is the original source of all avatars and he didn't want to disturb the Brijabasi's love for him by showing any great opulences. He did everything just like a sweet, helpless little baby. Sakatasura was killed by Krishna with absolutely no exertion. The gopas and gopis were struck with wonder. How is this possible? How is this possible? And the little children who were gathered around, they saw everything. They say, we saw what happened. Little Gopal cried for milk, but Mother Yashoda didn't come, so he kicked the cart with his little foot and it all broke up. And the gopas and gopis said, how can we listen to little children? This is all 
<laughs> Impossible. They didn't believe it. And Krishna was crying because he still wanted that milk. He was still crying. <laughs> so Mother Yashoda picked him up and fed him milk. And it is said when a child drinks the milk of his mother in a very enthusiastic way, that's the sign that he's in good health and he's protected. It's very auspicious. Something for you mothers to understand nicely. Of course, I'm sure you already know these things. <clears throat> so Nanda Maharaj called the Brahmins who he trusted so much and had them do yagyas and chant mantras and he gave profuse charity to them for the future protection of Gopal. Sakatasura represents carrying the load of old and new bad habits. Sometimes when we come to Krishna consciousness, especially at the beginning, there's a great enthusiasm because it's so new and it's so different and it's so wonderful and it's so exciting. But then after some time, some of those old bad habits that we haven't yet purified from our heart come back to haunt us like the ghost of Sakatasura. Sakatasura is ghost. You can't see ghost. Some people can, but most people cannot see ghosts. So similarly, our old habits for material enjoyment are like ghosts that want to haunt us, infatuate us, and kill our Krishna consciousness, kill Krishna within our heart. Srila Prabhupada even explained that generally, when a devotee, no matter how long that devotee is in Krishna consciousness, if they leave the path of bhakti, they usually go back to doing the same things they did before they became devotees. That means these, the ghost of these bad habits are still there, coming to haunt us and take us away from Krishna. the old songs we used to like to listen to. <laughs> Sometimes like ghosts, they just, ah, they just start haunting our minds, yes? And enticing us. Or the old television shows, or the old friends, or the old sentimental relations. Old bad habits. And we know what habit is. Habit is something that's very difficult to give up. Person is addicted to smoking or addicted to drinking or addicted to drugs. There's all these anonymous organizations. People are addicted to sex. People are addicted to gambling. So many addictions. And even if you try to give it up, it's very, very, very difficult because we've conditioned ourselves to depend on these things for a mental or physical state of peace or happiness. That's a problem. The more you find happiness in anything in this material world or anyone, you become, you condition yourself to be dependent on that thing or that person for your happiness. You become addicted to it. It's very hard to give up. And even advanced devotees, if they have any traces of desires, those habits are still there. And until we're very, very advanced devotees, those habits can come by and haunt us. Like a burden. These old and new habits that we have, bad habits, are like the burden of all the utensils on the cart of Sakatasura within our heart. And they're just waiting to just crash down on us and destroy our bhakti. Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada explained 
that the only way we can stay out of Maya is we have to replace it with Krishna. And that means we have to be engaged. Prabhupada said the idle mind is the devil's workshop. The idle mind is Sakatasura's workshop. <laughs> he was a devil. As soon as our mind is idle, then all the conditionings and the habits of the past start coming back ah, like a ghost to haunt us. Therefore, we should be very enthusiastic and very careful to always be engaged in some positive devotional service. Prabhupada said we have to be busy for Krishna. Satatam kirtiganto mama. And most of all, we have to learn at every moment to not only be busy for Krishna, but to take shelter of the holy name of Krishna. One of the greatest bad habits is lethargy, laziness for Krishna consciousness, or false pride. So everybody, let's fight against this lethargy and with great enthusiasm, loudly chant the holy name. <laughs> It was around that time that Gargamuni came to Mahaban Goku. Vasudev sent him because he was really concerned about Krishna and Balaram. He wanted him to get the, let them to get the blessings of this great sage. When Gargarishi approached Nanda Maharaj's house, Nanda Maharaj welcomed him with so much respect and honor because he was a Brahmin and a sage. He said, sages like you come to the house of householders because we are naturally very much affected and diverted by so many worldly considerations in our life. But you come just to remind us of the real goal and purpose of life. You take the guise of a beggar just to come into our house, but actually you're not coming to take anything. You're really coming to give us something, the most precious of all wealth, wisdom. It was decided Gargamuni wanted to do the name-giving ceremony for Krishna and Balaram. But the problem was, if they did it like all other festivals, Kamsa may hear about it. So they decided to do a very secret name-giving ceremony in the Goshala, the place where the cows were kept. And there Gargamuni revealed that this child, because he is bringing together the dynasties of the Brishnis and the Yadus. His name should be Shankarshan. And because in the future he will take great pleasure in exhibiting supernatural strength, his name will be Baladev or Balaram. And this child, he has appeared in this world in many ways. He comes to annihilate the miscreants, reestablish the principles of religion, and protect the devotees. He has appeared in a white form in Satya Yuga. He has appeared in a red form in Treta Yuga. He, will he has appeared in previous Kali Yugas in a golden form. And now he has appeared in this beautiful dark bluish form. This child, he will have powers like that of Lord Narayan, and he will always protect all the Brijabhasis from all dangers. Please take nice care of him. When Krishna, should I continue? 
Do you like this place? This is true opulence. <clears throat> Materialistic people, when they want to have a conference, <laughs> they rent out a ballroom in a five-star hotel in downtown Bombay, Oberoi or Marriott or Taj Mahal, yes? And they have nice seats and marble floors and beautiful golden... Um, gold leaf ceiling ornaments, chandeliers, yes. And they think that's opulence. But this is opulence. Sitting under the Kadamba, or sitting under the Kalpa Briksha streets of Braj, breathing and laying in the sacred dust of Vrindavan. And please understand the nature of this dust. There has been tons of cow dung and cow urine merging into the dust. Very sanctified, very pure. We have seen these cows, they just, they eat the grass and they pass the dung. And cow dung is very sacred, very pure. Prabhupada said it is antiseptic. In fact, they would bathe, the Brijabhasis would bathe Krishna and Balaram with cow dung and cow urine. That is how pure. And they pick it up and they make patties and they cook with it. Prabhupada said, first class fuel for cooking is cow dung. First class. Second class is wood. Third class is gas, and fourth class is electricity. But cow dung is the topmost cooking fuel. It actually smells sweet. Have you ever? That is sweet. And it makes mosquitoes go away also. So this is opulence sitting in the cow dung, the cow urine, and the dust of Vrindavan under the trees. And if you're attached to the Oberoi or Taj Mahal, <coughs> then if you do purify your heart, you, you may go to Vaikuntha. Unless you develop a taste for rolling in the dust of Vrindavan, you will not understand what the highest happiness could be. <clears throat> so, when Krishna in his first year, one day, Yashoda Mai had Krishna on her lap. And she wanted to make Krishna have nice fun. So she was lifting Krishna up and throwing him up in the air. Have you ever seen mothers do like that? She was just a little baby Krishna. She was just lifting and throwing, lifting and throwing. She was laughing and smiling and the gopis were watching and they were laughing and smiling and Krishna was laughing and smiling. But then Krishna was thinking that my mother, she can only lift me a little bit. But I want, but I want to play in the sky. <clears throat> My mother can only lift me a little bit, but I want to play in the sky. And he knew that there was a demon sent by Kamsa named Trinabharta, who explicitly wanted to, Krish to kill Yashoda and Krishna. So Krishna did not want Yashoda to be implicated in this painful situation. So he became very heavy, like a mountain. You showed him, I did, what's happening? <laughs> this was too much for her. All of a sudden, her little baby, who she's lifting up, has become so heavy, she can't even hold him anymore. So she sets him down, and she calls the Brahmins to come and chant mantras. 
And because she didn't know what else to do, she focused her mind in remembering Lord Narayan. Krishna was sitting on the ground of Braj when the mighty Asura Trinabharta came on the order of Kamsa. He was really powerful and deadly. He manifested the form of a whirlwind. And his blowing made such a roaring sound that it deafened everyone's ears. He was blowing a wind with such force that the dust rose from the sky and made the entire Gokul black with dust. Nobody could even see the hand in front of their face. And Yashoda Mai, her only concern was Gopal. She was running and looking for Gopal, but she couldn't see anything. She was crying out, Gopal, 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 where are you, Gopal? She, but she couldn't see anything. The winds were blowing, trees were falling down, massive roar, and she's just, she can't find Gopal anywhere. Helplessly, she fell unconscious to the ground like a cow that had just lost her calf. Meanwhile, Krishna, by his Aishwarya Shakti, became lighter than the lightest, just to facilitate Trinavarta's plan. Trinavarta picked up little Gopal and went higher and higher and higher and higher and higher into the sky. As he was going higher and higher into the sky, the dust cleared. Krishna was way, way up, practically in Swargaloka. <laughs> and Yashoda Mai, there was no Krishna anywhere. So she was just laying on the ground, piteously crying, and all the gopis were just gathered around her, weeping and crying, and loudly chanting Krishna's pastimes to somehow or other try to pacify her. But ultimately, they were all feeling so much separation, they could only cry. They were helpless. Their life was taken from them. Meanwhile, Krishna was enjoying the ride. After he fulfilled his desire of playing into the sky, and he fulfilled the ladies of the Swargaloka's desire to see him, he assumed the weight of a massive mountain. He was so heavy that Trinavarta could no longer go any higher. And then Krishna accepted the role of an ordinary little boy. Are you all awake? <laughs> Krishna looked down and he was so high in the sky that he became afraid. So he grasped on to Trinavarta's neck and squeezed it real hard because he was afraid of falling. <laughs> and as he, was, as he was squeezing Trinavarta's neck, he was choking the demon, and the demon was all of his might with his hands, was trying to pull Krishna off, and Krishna was just, just looking down, uh, and he was squeezing his neck, squeezing his neck, and squeezing his neck. He squeezed it so much that Trinavarta's eyes popped out. He couldn't breathe. He was trembling, he was perspiring, and ultimately Krishna blocked his air and choked him to death. And Trinavarta fell way, 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 way down and crashed onto a slab of stone and all of his limbs were dislocated. Sri Krishna Bhagavan Ki Jai! When the gopis saw Krishna laying on Trinavarta's obliterated body, <laughs> they became very much afraid. 
But Krishna was just joyfully smiling and laughing and playing. The gopis were amazed. They came to the conclusion that Trinavarta was killed by his own sins. And Narayan saved our little Krishna. Why? They were speculating amongst themselves. It, maybe it's because of our pious deeds. Or maybe it's because of our austerities. Or maybe it's because we worship the Supreme Personality of God. But the power of Yoga Maya would not allow them to even conceive of the thought that Krishna may have killed him. Why? Because then they could not love him so intimately and freely. Yoga Maya preserved the Madhurya Ras, the sweetness of the loving relations between the devotees and Lord Krishna. Trinavarta represents the Anarta, the demon that plagues the heart in the form of false pride due to scholarship. Krishna has six opulences. One is knowledge. When we get a little speck of that opulence in our own heart, just a little infinitesimal speck, and we become learned, it's very attractive. And people start to listen to us. Yes? And then they start respecting us. And then they start honoring us. And they may even touch our feet. Arivo. In this way, we begin to think that I am knowing more than others. I am better than others. And we start enjoying that position. In the Christian scripture, St. Paul said, Pride cometh before the fall. It is, a, it, is very un, it is very important to cultivate transcendental knowledge. But Maya is so clever and so powerful. Even if we're cultivating knowledge of the scriptures, she can make us proud of that. And the very knowledge that we're trying to cultivate to overcome Maya overcomes us. Prakriti kriyamanani guna karmani saravasha ahankara ityami ahankara vimudatma karatham ityamanyati. The bewildered spirit soul thinks themselves him or herself to be the doer of activities, but actually it is all being done by nature, and Krishna is the controller of nature. Krishna is the sarva karana karanam. He is the cause of all causes. It is said, do not be proud of borrowed plumes. Whatever knowledge we have is Krishna's. It is not ours. So yes, we have seen People learn a lot and then they start thinking themselves superior to others. And then Krishna is not pleased with anything you do or speak. It's all just superficial, external, without substance. So especially for devotees, this is very, very important. We should never be fa falsely proud of our scholarship. Rupa and Sanatan Goswami, we have been discussing them over the last few days. They were the greatest scholars. But yet, they were more humble than a blade of grass. They never considered themselves to be better than anyone. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is such a scholar. Rupa and Sanatan Goswami and Raghunath Das Goswami they, conf they awarded him the title Kaviraj, the king of poets. Can you imagine getting a title from them? 
And yet he's thinking he's lower than the worm and stool, more fallen than Jagai and Madha. <laughs> if we know by memory all the Vaishnava scriptures, if we really understand what, we're, what, we, what we have learned, then we will never consider ourselves better than even the illiterate sweeper of the street who's doing it for Krishna. That is realization. That is the Goswamis. That is the footsteps we must follow. There were devotees living in Vrindavan, one particular person. He was a scholar of Sanskrit. He was studying so many literatures. And he actually told Prabhupada, I want to go to somebody else who can teach me something higher. Can I have your blessing? And Prabhupada, with all humility, told him the reality. He said, you are asking me to give you a blessing to go to hell. What is the use of all the scholarship? And that person left and went to somebody else, and now he's an atheist. He was a Sanskrit scholar who was studying profusely the literatures of the Goswamis. But because he thought he knew better than his guru, yes, he learned more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Now he's a professor of Sanskrit in a major university in America. But he's an atheist. He doesn't even believe in Krishna. So we cannot be falsely proud. When the more we know, the more that demon of Trinavarta makes us think that we're becoming higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher. Yes? The more we know, we think we're getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher. But that's Trinavarta taking of us, our pride. It's our humility, our dedication, and our devotion that bring us higher and higher and higher. And knowledge is meant to facilitate that. Therefore, Prabhupada wanted us to study his books and really learn this philosophy. He wanted us to master the philosophy for our own sake and for the sake of others. But at the same time, he taught us we must always be in the spirit of the menial, humble servant of the servant of the servant. And in this way, we can achieve perfection when we chant the holy name. When Krishna killed these demons in Vrindavan, he did it in such a sweet and intimate way that he did not disturb the frame or the love of the Vrijbhasis. In fact, due to the anxiety that these demons created in the hearts of the Vrijbhasis, their love increased. Krishna allowed these demons. It was actually Krishna's Lila Shakti that allowed these demons to come into Vrindavan. Because every time a demon came and Krishna was in danger, the ocean of Prem increased and expanded within the hearts of the devotees. Should I continue? <laughs> Krishna began to crawl in Gokul. So beautiful. On the ground of Braj that was mixed with cow urine and cow dung, actually made muddy, Krishna and Balaram would crawl around 
and they would crawl with their arms and they looked like two little snakes crawling through the mud of Braj. In fact, this mud of the, the dust, the cow urine and the cow dung was like a beautiful ornamentation which was always dressing Krishna in Balaram. And they were, their mothers put little bells on their um, ankles so the mothers could easily find them. They were very, very restless. Sometimes they would see an older gopi walking and Krishna Balaram would think that this is Rohini, this is Yashoda. And they'd crawl, 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 crawl through the mud. They'd crawl, crawl, crawl to get to their mother. And they'd little, little, their ankle bells, and they'd hear the ankle bells of the gopis and they were thinking, this is my mother, this is my mother, and they're coming, coming, coming. And then the gopi would see and look, and they'd see, it's not their mother. And they'd become very much afraid and cry and try to crawl, crawl the other direction until they would find Yashoda and Rohini. And they would pick them up and embrace them and pacify them with their love. When they would be looking at Krishna and Balaram's beautiful faces, they would see little tiny teeth that looked like drops of milk just starting to form in their lotus-like mouths. <laughs> Yashoda and Rohini would, with their fingers, they would count the teeth and discuss with each other. Krishna's Kumar Lila. A little calf would be laying on the ground. Actually, two calves. Two calves would be sitting, laying next to each other on the ground, sleeping. And then little Krishna Balaram, they would crawl up to the calf because they hadn't learned how to walk yet. They would crawl up to the calf and Krishna would grab the tail of one and Balaram would grab the tail of the other. And then the calves would become very afraid and they'd get up and start running and Krishna and Balaram would be so afraid they'd be holding on and holding on and crying and crying and the kids would be running and children would be crying holding on and the gopis would drop everything they were doing they would just leave behind all their responsibilities and come running out and watch Krishna and Balaram being dragged through the mud and the cow dung and the cow urine of brudge by the calves and they would all be laughing and laughing and laughing this was the life of soul Hundreds and billions and trillions of quadrillions of times better than the best Hollywood film. <laughs> Just seeing and hearing and hearing about Krishna and Balaram's beautiful pastimes. And the gopis would save Krishna and stop the calves and take Krishna and Balaram and bring them to Yashoda and they'd feed them milk and they'd be satisfied. <clears throat> Sometimes the cowherd men would test Krishna's intelligence to see how he was becoming learned. And Nanda Maharaj, would, Upananda, the uncles of Krishna especially, they would like to do this. Upananda, Abhinanda, they'd say, Oh Gopal, point to your head. He'd point to his head. They'd say, point to your leg point to his leg. Krishna was very proud. He knew all these things. <laughs> point to your nose and Krishna very proudly would point to his nose. <laughs> point to your ears and Krishna wanted to show how he's learned so much. He'd point to his ear and say, point to your teeth. And Krishna would say, but I don't have any teeth yet. <laughs> In this way, Krishna would give so much happiness to the residents of Vrindavan. But Yashoda and Rohini were always in anxiety, transcendental anxiety, because they were always thinking when Krishna and Balaram are crawling around Braj, there is the horns of the cows and the bulls that may stab them, and there's the teeth of dogs, and there's thorns and the bushes and the grounds and there's the nails of the monkeys day and night Yashoda and Rohini 
were in anxiety about Krishna Balaram's welfare. And Krishna and Balaram went through every possible effort to increase their anxieties by their, by their naughtiness. Now, this material world is Kunta, the place of anxiety. And beyond this material existence is Vaikuntha, which means no anxiety. So how is that the highest planet of all the Vaikuntas, the highest people, Yashoda and Rohini, are always in anxiety? This is not material anxiety. The anxiety of Yashoda and Rohini was their total absorption in Vatsalya Ras, in their parental loving affection for Krishna and Balaram. And the more the anxiety, the more it increased the intensity of their love. This is absorption on the spiritual platform. It is billions and trillions unlimitedly more blissful state than Om Shanti 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 Sometimes I see our devotees chant this during fire yagyas. And I understand that's part of the ceremony. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Especially in marriages, I hear this. It just doesn't make sense to me. They really want Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, then why are they getting married? <laughs> Living with a wife or a husband, you know, I have so much anxiety. And then they have children, too much anxiety. And all the t parents are always thinking, I mean, it's so much anxiety with this child. I love my child, but it's so much anxiety. I can't wait till they grow up a little more and there'll be more or less anxiety. Well, now I have to hold, but when they start to crawl, then less anxiety. Then when they start to walk, there'll be less. Then they go to school. But actually, that's, that's illusory energy. We're always thinking, tomorrow, shanti, shanti, shanti. <laughs> with every stage of a child's development there's more intense complex anxieties yes you know, the anxiety of they want milk they, they're crying it's a little anxiety but wait till they start becoming teenagers <laughs> so yes but when the object of our anxiety is Krishna out of love that is ecstasy. Prabhupada taught us that we should put ourselves in situations where we are in great anxiety for the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That will bring about purification and ecstasy. Because after all, our happiness is in pleasing Krishna and Krishna's happiness he, his happiness is in our absorption to serve him, to please him. We have here Guru Charan Prabhu, who is the president of Prabhupada in Italy. So many anxieties there, I have seen. And we have Radhe Sham Prabhu, the president of Pune. Jai Jai Shri Radhe. Much louder, please. <laughs> so many anxieties he has to deal with. take these responsibilities. 
So, Same Rishi, he's president of Tawako Temple in New Jersey. So many of our devotees here have accepted positions where anxieties are just constantly piling upon them. But that anxiety is so pleasing to the Lord because it's, it's being tolerated and accepted in His service. It's an expression of love. So yes, Yashoda and Rohini were always in great anxiety, worrying for Krishna's protection at every moment. Krishna would try to walk. This is a very important pastime. Krishna is the ability in man. But in his original form, in Goloka, in Gokula, he's learning how to walk. And he's, he gets up right here in the dust of Braj, in Mahavan. Krishna would somehow, somehow stand up with his own legs and he'd take a step and fall down and cry. And then he'd get, try to get up and take another step and fall down and cry. And Yashoda Mai, she wanted to help Krishna to learn to walk. She would hold him by his little finger, like this. And she'd help him get up, and she'd walk with him. And because she was only touching his little finger like this, holding him up, Krishna was thinking that he was walking. But he understood he was completely depending on the help of his mother. And then that beautiful face, which was like a wilted lotus from his crying, blossomed into a most beautiful smile as he looked upon his mother, who was helping to teach him how to walk. The first thing Krishna did when he learned the art of walking was begin his pastimes of stealing butter. <laughs> Shall I continue? One day the gopis came together to approach Mother Yashoda. <clears throat> Their purpose was just to hear and speak about beautiful Gopal's glorious pastimes. One gopi complained to Yashoda that before dawn, little Gopal and his friends, they inspect the village of Braj just to see where the butter and yogurt is so that they could steal it later in the day. Another gopi said, Early in the morning, before we milk the cows, Krishna and his friends, they let go of all the calves. They untie them from the ropes and the calves go running outside and we go running, chasing after them. Come back, come back, come back. And while everyone in our families and all of our homes are out chasing the calves, they run into our homes and steal all of our butter. And when we come back, the pots are broken and all the butter is gone, or all over the floor. Another gopi said, sometimes he unties the calves before we milk the cows and brings the calves to the cows to drink all the milk. So when our husbands go to milk the cows, they come back with empty buckets because it's all gone. A few gopis came together and lodged this complaint. This was serious. We found Krishna in our house. He cracked open the clay pot that held the butter and he was eating the butter. We caught him. We said, we're going to beat you. We're going to tie you up. And Krishna smiled at us. When Krishna smiled upon us, our hearts melted. We were so captivated, so charmed 
so spellbound by his smile that we stood like motionless statues, unable to move. And right in front of our eyes, Krishna and his coward boys just ate all of our butter and all of our yogurt. He had no power to even take a step. What is the power of your son's smile? He showed him I asked, well, why don't you just feed him if you think he's hungry? If his belly is empty, just give him some food. And the gopis replied that if we do give him food, he doesn't want it. If we give him butter, he won't accept it. Your son has a taste for stealing. <laughs> One day, your Gopal, before he ate the butter himself, was feeding it to all the monkeys in our house. And he fed so much butter to monkeys, the monkeys became so full they went away. And then Gopal said, I don't want to eat this butter all alone. My friends have all left me. I haven't eaten yet. Monkeys, come back. But the monkeys went out into the trees. So Krishna became very angry. It's no fun eating butter all alone. And he broke all of our pots and threw all the butter on the floor in anger. Sometimes to protect our butter from Gopal and his friends, we keep it hanging from ropes from the rafters and our ceiling. But they will put boxes and they will climb on top of those. Or sometimes they will climb on top of a box and then climb on each other's shoulders to somehow reach that butter. And if we put it in such a way that even that doesn't work, Krishna has a special stick that has a pointed metal end. And he'll get on the top of his friend's shoulders and he'll, he'll poke the bottom of the butter pot, make a hole, and the butter will start flowing from that butter pot. And then he'll take his friends and put their, he'll, with his hands, and put their face and open their mouths so the butter falls right into their open mouths. Sometimes when we see Krishna stealing our yogurt and butter, we say, Krishna, you are a thief. And Krishna looks at us indignant and says, No, you are a thief. <laughs> Sometimes when, I when we hide our butter so nicely that Krishna cannot find it, he will pinch our babies and make them cry. Or sometimes he'll go into the cleanest place in our house where we do our worship and he'll pass stool and urine. 